In the beginning, their stadiums were either antiquated or inadequate. Most of their cities were considered minor league. Their coaches and players were rejects or retreads. Their franchises were scorned and sabotaged by the NFL establishment. There's no question about it. The AFL was the underdog. No one cared about the AFL. No one ever gave it a chance. You know, they call us a Mickey Mouse League at one particular stage of our growth and development. As an athlete, I was upset because everybody kept telling me that I wasn't good enough and we weren't good enough to play with them. The AFL was a life for all of us, and we had a chance to take something on, uh, to be an underdog, and to win. I think the AFL was the closest thing that I could find to family. I don't think I would have come close to the image of Broadway Joe and the Jets had I been somewhere in the NFL. We were entertainers. We made people feel good. We made people feel like they were a part of the team. It had brilliant tradition, great players, love, camaraderie, and a common goal that we all believed in. Rebels with a Cause. The story of the American Football League. Fortunately, the men who own teams in the new American Football League have a lot of money. And they seem to enjoy spending it. And they better not mind losing it. Paul Zimmerman, Los Angeles Times. In 1958, Johnny Unitas and the Baltimore Colts were on top of the pro football mountain with their dramatic overtime victory over the New York Giants. But like Mount Everest, it was a mountain that suddenly inspired others to climb if only because it was there. Takes, he gives to Amici and the ball game is over. Alan Amici has scored the touchdown and the Baltimore Colts are the professional football champions of the world. That's the end of the game. In Dallas, 26-year-old Lamar Hunt, the son of a wealthy Texas oil tycoon, had been a third string pass receiver at Southern Methodist. He understood the popularity of Texas football, the Cotton Bowl, the Southwest Conference, when he tried to buy the Chicago Cardinals, he was rebuffed. But he believed that other potential club owners also thought that another pro football league was an idea whose time had come. He believed that Dallas would cherish a pro football team. I felt that there was room for a second league. Baseball had two leagues, and why, why wouldn't it make sense for there to be a second league in football? Houston oil man Bud Adams emerged as Lamar Hunt's first ally in assembling the franchises in defiance of the NFL in 1959, when the AFL was born and immediately placed in an incubator. Houston sports writer Mickey Hershkowitz. They had like the names of four teams and four and four cities and four owners, and that was all they knew. They didn't have a schedule. They didn't have a television contract. No one who, who attended that press conference thought they had a chance of, of actually getting the league up and running. I don't think anyone thought there would ever be an opening day. But on September 9, 1960, the Boston Patriots kicked off to the Denver Broncos at Boston University Field. The Broncos won, 13-10. The New York Titans, Buffalo Bills, Dallas Texans, Houston Oilers, Oakland Raiders, and Los Angeles Chargers were the other six original teams stocked by the AFL's frantic first player draft on November 22, 1959. Texans owner, Lamar Hunt. There were only two or three people that really knew anything about football players, and we charged them with the concept of coming up with a plan whereby we could draft a bunch of names. Oilers owner Bud Adams. We took uh, the Street and Smith uh, uh, magazine and took all the graduating seniors and we took the top 10 running backs, top 10 ends, and we clipped their names out and then we had a hat and we all stuck our <laughs> name in the hat to pick out. Bill's owner Ralph Wilson. And that was your choice, because we, we didn't have any scouts or anything, and nobody knew anything about uh, who they would select. 
Joe Foss, who had been the governor of South Dakota, was named commissioner of the American Football League. He had been a World War II hero as a fighter pilot in the Pacific. Now, he was the counterpart to the new young NFL commissioner, Pete Rozelle. I did meet with uh, Joe Foss, the commissioner of the uh, new American Football League in St. Louis on Saturday. We had a very pleasant three or four hour conversation in an attempt to uh, develop an overall policy of cooperation and harmony, which we both feel will be possible to achieve. That peaceful coexistence soon turned into sabotage. The AFL had counted on Minnesota as one of its original teams, but suddenly the NFL captured the Minnesota Territory. Chargers owner, Baron Hilton. Apparently, they were able to work out a deal with the National Football League through George Hallis that they would be given a National Football League franchise if they would lead us down the rosy path, so to speak, to the day of the college draft and then defect. The NFL also had its eyes on football's popularity in Texas. In 1960, the NFL quickly established the Dallas Cowboys as its rival to Lamar Hunt's team. Cowboys president, Tex Schramm. There's no question that the emergence of the American Football League particularly with Lamar Hunt, a Dallas resident, as the founder and going to put a team in Dallas, accelerated the NFL's plans for expansion. Life in the early AFL was often bizarre. The most ludicrous moment occurred in 1961 in Boston when the Patriots were trying to hold off the Texans. Patriots' Gino Capaletti. We were ahead 28 to 21 and Cotton Davidson had thrown a long pass to Chris Burford, made a diving catch at the one yard line, and the clock showed no time left. The officials says, wait a minute, there's time for one play left. So they had to push everybody off the field. And in doing so, then all the fans had to get just on the perimeter of the field and the end zone. Texans coach Hank Stram. I told Cotton to call a slant pass to Burford. So anyway, he goes back in the pocket and he throws the ball and uh, it's deflected and flies out of the end zone, the game's over with. Boston Globe sports writer Will McDonough. Cotton Davidson, the quarterback who threw the ball, come up to him breathless and said, Hank, did you see what happened? Did you see what happened? And he said, what happened? He said, guy in the, a fan knocked the ball down, a guy in a raincoat. Texans, Abner Haynes. And I have it on film where you can see him. This guy eases out. And that ball was coming to Burford, and all of a sudden, it fell to the ground. And then I saw this guy out there just dancing. And referees didn't say nothing. They let him come on the field, and they, no, no, the game is over. And he was just out there. And we said, hey, look at this guy. What is he doing on the field? We tried to show him to it. They just, hey, man, the game's over. The NFL royalty didn't fear a coup d'etat. John Madden. There weren't a lot of people that thought that this thing could be pulled off. It was kind of always thought about as you don't have a chance. And I think that, that the NFL, you know, you say, well, if they knew they could have expanded, they didn't think it would work. That's why the people that started it and stuck with it, I have so much respect for and always will. In the eyes of the fans, the hastily formed AFL is a second-rate outfit, afflicted with cast-off players, wobbly financing, and bullheaded owners. Red Smith, New York Herald Tribune. Football's famous and familiar faces in those years were in the NFL, the best pro football could offer. The AFL, meanwhile, was taking almost anyone who would accept an offer especially those NFL bench warmers who were not getting a chance to play, such as Cleveland Browns quarterback, Len Dawson. Hank Stram. I told him that if uh, he could get out of his contract and his uh, association with the National Football League, I would take him in a minute and he could, he, you know, he'd play for us. I had played in the National Football League three years with Pittsburgh, two with Cleveland. I started two games. I never started and finished a game, regular or preseason, in those five years. Len Dawson. 
that when the American Football League came in, it provided the opportunity for a lot of guys like me. And when it came around and got, gave me that opportunity, I jumped at it. Other NFL rejects and retreads included Ben Davidson, George Blanda, Don Maynard, and Jack Kemp. Maynard and I were taxi squad players on the New York Giants of 1958. Jack Kemp. So the AFL opened up tremendous possibilities to all of the marginal players and all those who were soon to develop their own talent. When Broncos coach Frank Filchok needed help in his 1960 exhibition opener, he even reached into his coaching staff for longtime Canadian Football League quarterback Frank Trapuca. The way it got around to me playing was we played an inner squad game up in Golden, and it was the first taste of pro football that Denver was going to get. They had a tough time of it that night. They, the halftime score was still 0-0. So Filchok says to me, he says, heck, you're in shape. Uh, why don't you put a uniform on and go out there the second half and give the people their money's worth? So I said, well, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll give it a shot. So I go out there and threw some passes and completed a few and, and uh, you know, put the ball in the air. So uh, with that, uh, four years later, I was still putting the ball up in the air. We decided to hold a camp because so many boys came to me asking for a chance. We'll have them throwing, catching, sprinting, and the linemen pulling out and showing different types of blocking. If only one boy out of the candidates looks like a good prospect, I'll be satisfied that the camp was worthwhile. Buster Ramsey, Buffalo Bills head coach. In the AFL's search for players, tryouts were open to any and every Walter Mitty that ever dreamed of playing pro football. For the Los Angeles Chargers, assistant coach Jack Faulkner conducted the tryout. We had every bartender, every truck driver in, in, in the Los Angeles area show up. I mean, it was hilarious. We were inviting the, the guys to come, and, and this was a dream for them to try to make a, make a team. Well, we got some publicity from them, but also in, in the process, we had guys planted in there that we had already had a contract with them so that we didn't come out of that that tryout without having some good football players. And we made a big hullabaloo about, gee, what a great, wow, how did we find this guy? <laughs> Harry guy, right here in Los Angeles, and we got three really good players. But if the AFL were to build a solid future, it needed to sign a solid share of the best college players. And now it's my pleasure to present Look Magazine's All-America football team for 1961. Lance Howard. University of Arkansas. John Madden. But if they were going to get the real talent, they had to get it out of the college draft. And they had to get it, you know, they had to beat the NFL to get it. And they weren't going to get second-rate players. I mean, they weren't going to say, okay, NFL, you draft all the players you want, and we'll take what's left. They were going after the same player. The leagues dueled with dollars, sometimes moments after a player's last college game. Raider executive Al Locasau. Usually it was... This is the first time I can legally sign this player. I don't want to give him the other side three more minutes. You get out there and you get it done. There are times when a guy would be ready to sign and the other team's guy is outside screaming, wait, 5,000 more, hold on, don't sign that thing. Down in the south where they see you all, there's a man known as Mr. Football Vinicat. The 1959 Heisman Trophy winner, Louisiana State running back Billy Cannon, signed with teams in both leagues. Uh, Billy Cannon was already drafted by the new American Football League, has been drafted today by the National Football League, and says he will play with the National League. Now, do you expect to run into that problem very often? You will from time to time, that's for sure. What are you going to do about it? Well, I think you can say, if I can interject here, uh, these players have got the choice. For the first time in, I guess, 10 years, they have a choice of where they can go play. There might be argument as to whether Billy Cannon was the best runner, the best blocker, the best pass receiver, the best defense man. In fact, the Rams' great problem is going to find a way to use him. Even though Billy had signed with the Rams, the Oilers doubled the Rams' offer. Bud Adams. I said, have you signed? I said, you can tell me right now. It won't make a difference. Just tell me, have you signed? He said, yes, I did, Mr. Adams. And, 
but how do, what do I do to get that twice that salary? He said, we sign you under the goalpost. That's when we said, well, will that get the job done? I said, yes, because I don't think they're going to do anything about it. But the Rams went to court. The judge ruled Billy Cannon could choose his team. He and the Oilers would win the first two AFL titles. Mickey Hershkowitz. Cannon, I can't say just gave them legitimacy because they battled years to attain that. But Cannon gave them a dramatic shot in the arm from the standpoint of that one-time publicity event. But the other thing he did for the Oilers and the AFL was sent a big message to the NFL that we won't lay down. We're not doing this on the cheap. We will fight you. We will compete. We will go head-to-head, dollar-for-dollar. So far, the AFL has been truly a joke league, earning it the name the Mickey Mouse League from the NFL. Arthur Daly, New York Times. Our first year in professional football was both nerve-wracking and gratifying. Abner Haynes and Johnny Robinson kept all the Texan fans on the edge of their seats throughout the season and still managed... Sometimes, out of necessity, razzle-dazzle was the AFL style. John Madden... I knew that the AFL was going to stay when someone said to Lamar's father, H.L. Hunt, you know, your son lost a million dollars this year, and, you know, doesn't that bother you? And he says, well, not really. He said, at that rate, he said he can just go another 150 years. And I think that's, that's the thing. It's like a fighter. You hit a guy, boom, with your best punch, and the guy laughs at you. I think that statement put everything into perspective and says, hey, if you're going to stay in this fight, you better bring your lunch because it's not going to be over quickly. But to keep the AFL alive, the Oakland franchise needed quick cash from Bill's owner, Ralph Wilson. Will McDonough. Wayne Valley, of the then owned the Raiders, was going to fold his team and call Ralph about it. And Ralph said, you do that, you, you put us out of business. We can't play with seven teams. How much money do you need? Ralph Wilson. He said, uh, $400,000 to keep going. I said, okay, uh, I'll loan you the $400,000. And he gave me some interest in the team. Which is illegal as heck. I'll give you the $400,000. So he exchanged it for 25% of the team. To my way, they get help to save the league. Because uh, Wayne uh, was very sincere. They were going out of business. It would have been a black eye for the league if one of the franchises had gone bankrupt. Each year we'd go to the annual meeting and we would bring our financials to say how much we had lost. Patriots owner Billy Sullivan. They would uh, say, well, you know, I only lost a million three, or I only lost this or that because of them. That didn't mean much. It meant a lot to Wayne Valley because he said, you know, when I hear you guys boasting about the fact that you didn't lose both shirts, you just lost the sleeves of one of them. He said, that annoys me. I think I, I'd like to move that we change the name of the AFL to the Foolish Club. The club owners were not the only members of the Foolish Club. The coaches and players often felt a little foolish themselves, especially when they had to practice on sandlots or in schoolyards. <laughs> Joe Namath. Oh, I can remember getting on buses with uh, Coach Eubank, going somewhere up the Grand Central to the school. I never, this is a little grade school or high school. We said, now fellas, we have to do one thing before we start practice. Now I want you guys to line up there across this line, everybody with their hats in their hands. Now let's walk down the field, pick up these rocks before we practice. And on Sunday, the games were played in some of America's oldest and most outmoded stadiums. Patriots linebacker, Nick Bonaconti. War Memorial Stadium in Buffalo was the worst stadium you could possibly ever think about playing. First of all, just getting to the locker room. We had to go up a steel staircase that went straight up. And then when he got up to the locker room, the locker room was probably no bigger than 50 by 75. All the lockers were closed in. They had maybe four shower heads that even worked. Houston, Jefferson Stadium, there, you know, there's no grass on the field. Buffalo Bills, Paul McGuire. 
Then that early erector set, Frank Ewell Field up in Oakland. I mean, come on, that thing, you know, people would start swinging. If they, if they had ever had the wave in those days, that whole thing would have come down. I swear to God, it's the worst looking mess I ever saw. He played in an erector set. It was, it was terrible. Another joke was the Denver Broncos brown and gold uniform. Check the socks. Bronco coach Jack Faulkner. There's one sock that I have, and one sock is in the Hall of Fame. This is what it looks like. Verticals look like the Globetrotters. I mean, it was absolutely hideous. First time we walked out on the field with these things on an exhibition game, the opposing team started laughing at us, and we felt a little bit embarrassed. Frank Chapuca. But not only were the striped socks strange to football, but the fit of the uniform. I had to cut out the armpit underneath my armpit in order to raise my arm in order to throw a, throw a pad. That's how small these uniforms were. So one of our preseason games, we just got a big tub out there and we burnt all the uniforms, this sock and all those things. We would drop one, two, three, just keep dropping the socks and the people went wild. They thought it was just great. But in the AFL's early years, the NFL owners were laughing the loudest. Brown's owner, Art Modell. We thought it was an inferior league, an inferior brand of football. We scoffed at it, we laughed at it, uh, perhaps unwisely, but we felt that we're the National Football League and everything else, by comparison, is a weaker substitution. Gino Capaletti. There was uh, some comments every now and then about the AFL being referred to as the Mickey Mouse League, and that kind of just inspired us a little bit more to uh, maybe try to compete. We were the underdog. We were the guys that weren't going to be there in the end. Uh, we were going to be overcome by the NFL. Chief's executive, Don Klosterman. There's one th fiber that was really very apparent to all of us in the league, and that's a commonality of interest, that we all wanted this thing to, to work. This feeling of camaraderie glued the league together. Paul McGuire. We went out in a block of 33 guys and had a party. We had a party every Tuesday night. We had a meeting. <laughs> we had a meeting, we played cards, and we drank and had a great time every Tuesday night, and you didn't miss it. In early 1965, in New Orleans at the AFL All-Star Game, that camaraderie turned into social consciousness. Nick Bonaconti. We go to check into a hotel, and the white guys go into one hotel, and the black guys are put in another hotel. I mean, we thought, what the hell is going on? The Chiefs, Dave Grayson. And I remember as we were walking along the quarters, we were listening to some James Brown, and uh, we decided to try to go into this club, and the doorman, who had a gun in his waistband, started to pull it and told Ernie if he walked through this door, he was going to kill him. The Bills, Ernie Warlick. Someone said, hey, tax it, we want to tax it. And the guy said, with this southern drawl, says, we have to call y'all a colored cab. So uh, Cookie said, Hey, I don't give a damn what color it is. We just want a tab. We don't care what color. Abner Haynes. So we get registered, and we go and get on the elevator, and the elevator operator says, Ooh, look at all of these monkeys. Look at all of these monkeys getting on the elevator. Where are all these black monkeys coming from? East Captain Jack Kemp. You couldn't help but see the pain that they were going through and share in it if you, if you cared anything about your team and your huddle and your relationships with your friends. I was very upset, and I decided that the thing for us to do was, was uh, to go home. Chargers, Ron Mix. And there was going to be a practice session that morning. And so uh, I'd gotten on the bus, and I forgot who the coach was, but he stood up and said, Where's Bobby Bell? I don't see him. Where's Dave Grayson? Hey, where are all the black guys? The black guys are missing. And one, of the, one of the players said, they're all having a meeting. They might not play in the game. And the consensus was is that they just were not going to go out there and play. What's the next move? Will the game be played and where? The game will be played uh, January 16th at uh, 1 uh, p.m. Central Standard Time in Houston, Texas, in Jefferson Stadium, the home of the Houston Oilers. We all got in an airplane. I mean, we got in an airplane on Thursday, white guys, black guys, all congratulating each other, hugging each other, because we were able to pull a coup and, and get them to transfer that game down to Houston. 
We went down to Houston. I think we had like 5,000 people to watch, to watch the AFL All-Star game. But believe me, it was worth it. Racism is not good business. And that's the whole point of why I love the AFL, is that these guys were committed to having a league for everybody. The AFL players were together, but they were still far away from the NFL. Since the American League started playing in 1960, the older National League has practically ignored its existence. Frank Litsky, New York Times. Pro football from the inside. Is that what you really want, George? That's it. And then at the end, I go into a real game and run off a few plays at quarterback. A real game? You've got to be kidding. No, that's what the whole thing is leading to. <laughs> I just don't think it will work. Have you tried the AFL? The NFL remains smugly arrogant. Even when the Dallas Texans won the 1962 AFL championship in overtime on ABC television, they did it backwards. We will kick to the clock. You're going to kick? Yes. To the clock. Right. Well, I tell you, over on that Dallas bench, uh, they're going wild, Kurt. They don't know what's going on. Abner Haynes elected to kick off with a club, and I'm sure that's uh, not the unanimous opinion of the bench over there. And whether or not it's going to pay off, we're going to have to wait and see. It's yours, Kurt. Kicking against the wind. Game aside, 17-17. Crossing a hole in the 24. And watch it. The big rush is on. The kick is up. The kick is good. Dallas is the champion. Dallas wins it on a 24-yard field goal by Tommy Brooker. They had to go into the second overtime period to win it. There's their coach, Hank Stram. It was a great tribute, I think, to our squad. And uh, we're just as proud as can we that we can win the championship and bring it back to Dallas, Texas. Here's, Even uh, though the champion Texans had outdrawn the Cowboys at the box office that season, Lamar Hunt moved the team to Kansas City. But year by year, the struggle for the best college players kept heating up. To succeed, the AFL knew it had to sign more quality players. Al Locasal. The NFL came out with this NFL and you, a real fancy 160-page booklet on the history of the NFL and how all these players had gone on to be Supreme Court judges and, and whatever. Our brochure was about 16 pages because we had no record. And I would say to kids, you have a choice. Here's the two brochures. You can go with that league and read about the history, or you can come with our league and help write it. The war is on. Well-heeled, oily-tongued pitchmen of the two leagues are on the college campuses to aim bankrolls and sales talks at the college heroes. The Sporting News. Bud Adams. We were doing all kinds of things, signing players, you know. Uh, we were, uh, it was cash involved. There was houses and swimming pools and uh, cattle, uh, uh, tractors, you name it. And uh, whatever fit the guy's fancy. The NFL couldn't tell the AFL what to do. The AFL couldn't tell the NFL what to do. So it was, you could do whatever you wanted to do. And if you wanted to grab a player, sign them under the table, above the table, you know, fly him here, fly him there. I mean, in one door, out the other. There was no rules. There was no commissioner for all of football. But there was a common denominator, the pursuit of new players. AFL and NFL executives, coaches, and scouts traveled everywhere to babysit six-foot, 200-pound babies. Don Klosterman. They absolutely would not allow anybody, associated with an American Football League team, they would not allow them in the vicinity of the player. They'd ask you, what are you doing here? I mean, they had no right to do this. In fact, we had several fist fights that broke out with, what do you mean, what am I doing? This is a, I can walk down the hall here. No, you can't. You can't walk in this hotel. This is an NFL hotel. We, we had Otis Taylor hidden out in a motel in North Dallas. Cowboys president, Tex Stram. We thought everything was hunky-dory, and what happened was, of course, the AFL, they, were, they weren't sleeping totally, and they had a smart... Uh, general manager up there by the name of Don Klosterman. I called Otis's mother, told her that I thought his, her son had been kidnapped. Wide receiver Otis Taylor. It wasn't anything against the law or anything. It was just a protection thing for me, per se. They had kind of talked me in. The guy that was babysitting me, he never did come in the room. He'd sit on the outside. Lloyd Wells, who was uh, one of our scouts and was in charge of this 
scenario of following up on Otis. He said, well, they moved into Dallas at the Holiday Inn. So I said, you've got to go up there and wait until the sun goes down. And, you know, find out where he is, knock on the window, and tell Otis. As Otis had always liked to get one of them, a red T-bird. Just tell Otis his red T-bird is parked at the Kansas City Chiefs facility. He sent a message by the uh, one of the room service guys that he was outside. I think he's very true in saying, man, don't disappoint me now. You know all how good we, friends we've been. Before I knew it, I was climbing out the window heading for Kansas City. Otis Taylor, out of Prairie View A&M, was one of many young black players that the AFL mined, not only from the small, predominantly black colleges, but also the major universities. Pro football's new league confounds its doubters. Better teams, bigger crowds, newer stadiums, and fancy play now add up to a successful future for the league. Robert Boyle, Sports Illustrated. Even with the Titans playing in the dilapidated polo grounds, the AFL had needed New York. But in 1963, the AFL no longer needed the Titans' bankrupt owner, Harry Wismer. Buffalo sports writer Larry Felser. There was a time when there was a fear if the league could no longer carry the Titans that the league itself would go under because they needed some sort of flagship franchise in, the, in New York. Sonny Werblin organized the ownership group that bought the New York franchise in 1963, renamed it the Jets, and turned game time into showtime. And he understood show business. He understood that, that football and... You know, and coaches really don't like to admit it. And players, you know, I mean, we're like, you know, it's X's and O's and hit and fundamentals, bend your knees, keep your head up. You know what I mean? But, but it really is show business. You can put something out there, and if people don't come and watch it, then you don't have anything. And I think Sonny Werblin knew that. Sonny knew the importance of television. He put together a $36 million contract with NBC that solidified the AFL and stunned the NFL. Art Modell. We were told at a special meeting that NBC entered into a five-year contract to be the sole network televising AFL games. I remember I said, they're here to stay now for sure. Thank you. That's official. Five checks totaling $1,250,000 changed hands at the AFL headquarters. The donor, NBC, the recipients, five of the AFL's teams that could use the money. Its purpose, to acquire talented football players who have just finished their collegiate careers for the AFL, not the rival NFL. William Wallace, New York Times. With its new television deal, the AFL suddenly had a bigger stage for its wide open style and its best players. Some were all-stars, and some were on their way to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. wide open. It was exciting, enervating football. Balls were flying through the air, bodies were flying through the air. Blitzes and, you know, everybody coming to rush the passer. I mean, it was a shootout. I mean, it, it was like, you know, run and shoot football, and the fans loved it. The styles of the two leagues were as different as the spelling of the words national and American. The NFL was like uh, shirt ties, stand up straight, we are the NFL, and it was sort of a different. The AFL was like, we're going to entertain you, we're going to make you feel good, you're going to be able to holler and shout, you're going to be able to touch the players, you're going to be able to tell them exactly what you feel at that time. I mean, if someone come and said, let's try something, let's put the names in the jerseys, boom, I mean, the AFL would do it. Let's use a different kind of ball, let's go for two-point conversion. 
let's pass. I mean, let's go out and pass every down. And that was what the AFL represented to me was if you don't have to do it an old way. If there's a new way or if there's a better way, just go and try it. First time he was 50, went cover seven. Second time he was 40, still went cover seven. I haven't seen any strong coverage yet. Sid Gilman created the 1963 champion Chargers. One of his assistants had been Al Davis. Not only were his uh, X's and O's great, but his organization, his teaching methods, and his work ethic. Sid was the first in the development of film. We would cut up films of every player in the league. We would study every player, how he ran different patterns, and it was just like working in a uh, science laboratory trying to develop something. Sid's whole idea was, hey, it's okay to pass any time you want on any down and open up the game, and it's the quickest way to score. He had Lance Allworth, too. I mean, I mean he had some great plays. You, you me throw it to one guy, and you can get a touchdown. Take a drive corner, Lance, or, you know, coming in from a good wide position and starting right down that middle and then breaking it off and taking it to the corner. You'll lose him. You'll lose him. In all of sports, there's never been a more apt or more accurate nickname than the one born by Lance Allworth. It doesn't please him, but the image it evokes is of Lance running, jumping, dodging, all with incredible grace. And that style is Lance Allworth. They call him Bambi. Edwin Schrake, Sports Illustrated. Better players and better teams were not enough. The AFL needed better stadiums, and it got them. So San Diego went to the polls and voted overwhelmingly in favor of a new $27 million sports stadium. The AFL now had more new stadiums than the NFL. Here we see an aerial view of the new home of the New York Jets and Mets. A Shea Stadium in Flushing Meadows. New York had a new sports stage. And Sonny Werblin put a star on that stage. Joe Namath signed what was then considered a fabulous $427,000 four-year contract. He had also been drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals, but the NFL never had a chance. Joe Namath needed knee surgery, but Sonny Werblin had recognized star quality. Joe Namath. When I first met with Mr. Werblin, he didn't ask what I wanted. He said, Joe, we're going to give you this. I know it's better than their offer. We want you. I don't want to bicker over dollars and cents. He says, you take this and come to work with us. We want you in New York. But just for openers, he was uh, ahead of what I had even ever dreamt about, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, I can remember getting in a coffee shop with a buddy back at Tuscaloosa and sitting there looking at each other. Do you believe this? You know, do you believe this much money? Joe Namath would turn out to be a bargain, both for the Jets and the entire AFL. What about your personal relations with the other ball players? Do you think uh, they'd be down on you uh, for commanding such a high price to sign? No, I don't see any reason why they should, really. Uh, they want to win ball games. I want to win. And uh, we both, I, I, I believe, we, everyone wants to get along good. Mr. Werblin, I can remember this so well. He says, Joseph, he says, New York is the greatest city in the world with the greatest people. He says, I want you to get to know them. He says, get out there and mingle. Visit with them. He said, I don't care if you spend your whole salary this year. Go out and enjoy. I said, thank you. Yes, I will. And I did. He's a hero. He's a pro. He's a Mr. Something Else on Broadway show. He's a groovy super guy. He can pass a football through a needle's eye. One, two, three, hip, go, go, go. No one else can score like Broadway What they needed at the time it needed someone that you could look and say is one of the best. You know, you didn't have to say what league he was in. I mean, Joe Namath was a great quarterback in any league. And then for years having to play against him, I'll tell you, it was tough. But with the price going up and up for Joe Namath and other players, club owners in both leagues began thinking about a treaty that would ease the drain on their checking accounts.
It cannot be denied that both the AFL and the NFL owners have been drawn irresistibly closer together by that great equalizer, money. Or rather, the loss of it. Dan Jenkins, Sports Illustrated. Coming out of college, a touted draft choice now could command more money than many longtime veterans. Cowboys president, Tex Schramm. As much as I dislike the AFL, I could see what it was doing to the game from a competitive standpoint. The draft no longer was a draft in which the lower teams drafted the better players and had an opportunity to move up and so forth. The draft was now becoming entirely money. Draft picks Dick Butkus, Gail Sayers, and Tommy Nobis had cost the NFL big money. Al Davis. As I've often said, we are like the gorillas in guerrilla warfare, and I've often said uh, the gorilla wins if he doesn't lose. And as long as we hung around, we were a thorn in their side. They feared us, and uh, we had uh, quality people. We weren't afraid of them, and uh, we could handle them. Oilers owner Bud Adams. As the fight went on and got uh, more bloody and, and brutal, uh, in signing players, I think uh, the, the feeling was, you know, uh, it, the best of two worlds would be to have a merger. And uh, how to get there was another question. Dallas, April 6, 1966. AFL founder and Chiefs owner, Lamar Hunt, accepted Cowboys president Tex Stram's invitation to talk peace in a parking lot. Lamar Hunt. We agreed to meet at the Texas Ranger statue at Old Love Field in Dallas. And uh, we met there and then went out and sat in Texas' car in the dark in the parking lot. And he first outlined for me the generalities of uh, a plan that he thought might be doable. He said, OK, I'm, I'm interested. Let's, let's go ahead. And the funny thing was, he got back on the airplane. And you know where the airplane was going? It was going to Houston. And you know what the purpose was? To elect Al Davis as the commissioner of the league. If the AFL were guerrilla fighters, Al Davis was their general. Tough, smart, determined, relentless. I really didn't want to become the commissioner of the American football league. I love the league, but I've been head coach, general manager of the Raiders. I've been coach of the year. My dream was to be just a great coach and work with young guys. But our league was threatened at the time, and several people asked me to become the commissioner. And I said, OK, I'd do it. With Al Davis, the AFL finally has a commissioner that has a mission to prosecute the National Football League. Tex Mall, Sports Illustrated. When kicker Pete Gogolak jumped from the two-time champion Bills to the NFL Giants a few weeks later, Al Davis organized his guerrilla campaign. I was sitting in the office with Ralph Wilson, and someone came in and told us that the Giants had just signed Ralph Wilson's kicker, Pete Kogelak, who had played out his option. And that's when I said to Ralph, we just got a merger. And uh, Ralph looked at me, and I said, look, if we go out and sign their players, we'll destroy them, and they'll come to the table. Bill's owner, Ralph Wilson. Our owners went absolutely berserk that the NFL would come in and sign one of our players. And we said, well, if they can do that, we're going to go after their players. And then uh, all hell broke loose. Rams quarterback Roman Gabriel was snatched by Al Davis for the Raiders. Bears tight end Mike Ditka and 49ers quarterback John Brody were signed by the Oilers. Brody agreed to jump the night before Lamar Hunt was to attend another merger meeting. Lamar asked me to hold off and I wouldn't do it. And we signed him that night. And uh, I said to Lamar on the phone, you may not think so, but you'll be stronger in that meeting tomorrow than you were if I didn't sign him. Not every AFL club owner agreed with Al Davis, but his tactics would shape the terms of the treaty. It was not an AFL action, it was, a, it was an Al Davis action, working with the Raiders and the Oilers organizations, as I remember. Uh, and it, it really almost blew the merger up, but uh, by June 8th, the, 
two sides had agreed and worked it out and there was indeed a merger. New York, June 8, 1966. The AFL's stature would be tested in the Super Bowl. The merger included a common draft in 1967, realignment in 1970. Pete Rozelle was the commissioner. Al Davis went back to the Raiders. Brody, Gabriel, and Ditka returned to their NFL teams. The AFL expanded to Miami and Cincinnati. This is an NFL ball. It kicks a little bit better, it throws a bit better, and it catches better. It's an NFL ball. Vince Lombardi. There'll never be another game in any sport at any level to equal the, the tension and the chemistry of the first Super Bowl game between the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs. Mickey Hershkowitz. Because it was the only time that there was a straight line drawn right down the middle between the two teams. Everybody was on one side or the other. No one was neutral. Buffalo sports writer Larry Felzer. Both networks, NBC and CBS, televised the game. And I remember Kurt Gowdy and Paul Christman, they had game faces on just as stern that day as the players did. I've never been a rooting broadcaster. I don't think you should be a homer. And I went right down the middle of the game. But inside myself, I at least wanted the AFL to make a good appearance in the game, you know, to make it close. I didn't think they could beat the Packers. Kurt Gowdy was right both ways. On the first Super Sunday, the Chiefs made a good appearance in the first half, trailing only 14 to 10. At halftime, the clock struck midnight on the AFL. For 15 minutes, they had people all excited, but in the end, they were squashed 35-10. Sid Ziff, L.A. Times. Browns owner Art Modell. After the first win over Kansas City, we had an executive committee meeting of the league the next morning. And when Lombardi walked in representing the Green Bay Packers, he got a standing ovation. That's how important it was to us. Will McDonough. After the game, Vince Lombardi said, I didn't want to say anything until now, but we get so many teams better in the National Football League. He named the Chicago Bears, the Detroit Lions, and everything. Larry Felser. It, it's always been written that it was almost dragged out of him. I was there, and my perception was that it was not dragged out of him at all, that he wanted it out. The Chiefs have great team speed, but I'd have to say NFL football is tougher. Their teams don't compare with the top National Football League teams. Vince Lombardi. Move back a little bit, man. Move back. Those words haunted the AFL. But the Broncos shocked the Detroit Lions in the first AFL-NFL exhibition. The Chiefs' chance for redemption came against the Chicago Bears. The Chiefs' Fred Arbanis. We had been teased, we had been scorned all spring and all first part of the summer long about how lousy a football team we were, about how lousy of a league that we played in, and we had no business you know, playing against the National Football League. Otis Taylor. We were crazy all week. We were crazy. We never had a practice like that. We were killing people. That night, boy, we came out of that, it's, it's like steam that just flowing, you know, we just, I was half crazy. The Chiefs took no prisoners. Quarterback, Len Dawson. We wanted to beat them as badly as we possibly could. I can remember Fred Arbanis on the sidelines. We had scored 66 points, I believe. He said, let's make it 100, and he was serious. Kansas City they had a uh, horse called War Paint. When you scored a touchdown or a field goal, then Bob Johnson used to ride him bareback. I think it was about the fourth quarter, and Butkus is looking at me, and he said, Dawson, he says, you guys are rotten. He said, you don't give a damn about us. At least you should have some compassion for that damn horse that's running around here all the time. You're going to kill it. Lamar Hunt. At that point, it was the greatest defeat in the history of the Chicago Bears in points. Now people say, well, well this is a preseason game, but it counted a lot that night and obviously nationally it was a shocking story to have one of the NFL's top teams, especially Mr. Hallis's team, beaten by 42 points.
But when the Packers battered the Raiders in Super Bowl II, 33 to 14, the AFL still had its skeptics. Then on January 12, 1969, the pro football world would turn upside down. NBC Sports presents the third AFL NFL World Championship game, the Super Bowl. The American Football League champions, the New York Jets, versus the National Football League champions, the Baltimore Colts. Joe Namath, of course, is the man that the Colts have to stop. If Namath has a good day, the Jets are usually good. If he doesn't, they have trouble. But Namath has not been bashful this week. He's come down here to, uh, to uh, Miami, and he has said that the Jets are going to win. He doesn't even predict it. He says, I guarantee a Jet victory. With a 15-1 record, the Colts had opened as a 17-point betting favorite. But in Miami that week, Broadway Joe would arm his teammates with confidence and forever establish his place in the pro football sun. Joe Namath. Ten days I've been listening to this. We're going to kill you, Namath. You know, come on, give us a break. You know how in your neighborhood, you know, it's our guys against their guys. No one likes to be told you're not going to win. You're not good enough. That team's that much better than you guys. You know, you get it up to here and how much more you're going to take. And I told the guy, I said, hey, wait a minute. I've been hearing this for 10 days now. You guys have been talking a lot. Well, I got news for you. We're going to win the game. I guarantee you. Well, everybody thought he was crazy. But he was trying to build up the confidence of his teams. And uh, I think he really felt that way. He was a cocky guy and he was confident. Jets coach, Weeb Eubank. I said, Joe. Shula's going to use that against us. He's, he's going to try to make that, get them ready, fire them up for the game. He said, Coach, if Shula has to do that, we're going to beat him anyway because we're going to be ready. I would have got you in the middle tank, but I wanted to go in at 37, it see? It doesn't matter. That's what I know, that's what I would have, you know. I'd, if it had been the game thing, I might have went that way. Yeah, right, right. The Jets' defense intercepted Earl Morrow four times, three in the first half. Fullback Matt Snell's touchdown on a four-yard sweep preceded Jim Turner's three field goals. Joe Namath completed 17 of 28 passes for 206 yards. But I can remember to this day looking up at that clock, 6-11. My heart was pounding, and I said, please, God, run that clock. I was, I was, if, if I was worried at all about losing that game it was then on it was from 6 11 down we were so close to having this dream come true and that is again after richardson has the ball the game is over the new york jets are the world champions they have upset the baltimore Colts and beat them handily here today 16 to 7 gives the afl the first super bowl championship they said it would be years before they play a close game, and they almost shut out the Colts today. Paul McGuire. All of a sudden, it's over. And each guy looked at each other and says, my God, we did it. Not they did it. We did it. We beat them. The American Football League won our respect for every single guy in the American Football League that day. I think every, every guy that ever played in the AFL felt the same way. One of the best feelings about all of this is feeling actually a part of a league that was scoffed at, that wasn't accepted, that struggled for years. And it wasn't me, because I came in the league in 65. I'm talking about the guys from 60 on. And when we got back, to the hotel after that game. I can remember the three guys I saw. Emma Thomas and Buck Buchanan and Willie Lanier, three of the Chiefs. They greeted us as we got off the bus and we hugged and we felt good about it. Even so, NFL loyalists didn't accept the AFL as equals going into Super Bowl IV in New Orleans. The Chiefs against the Minnesota Vikings. The Purple People Eaters were a 14 point favorite. The Chiefs, Fred Arbanis. We were kicked around as being the, the you know, not quite as good as, as the Vikings or as the, the National Football 
league, even though the Jets had uh, proven different uh, before that. Uh, we went out there and we knew we had a mission to accomplish. 65 toss power trap. Get in there for 65 toss power trap. Let's block. Let's Come on. Let's, let's, let's get seven ball. points. Come on, let's go. It's in there. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you that, baby. Yes, sir, boys. When the Chiefs dominated the Vikings 23-7, even the NFL diehards had to agree. The best AFL team was now better than the best NFL team. Hank Stram. All this time we were trying to prove something, prove something, prove something. Keep knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door. Finally you knock it down, you're in and you're standing there holding the trophy. Again, could I get your reaction, uh, Lamar Hunt, as you look back to those other years, some 10 years ago, there must be quite a reaction. Well, it's pretty fantastic. It's a beautiful trophy, and it really is a satisfying conclusion to the 10 years of the American Football League. And the the AFL's success would inspire two more pro football leagues, a basketball league and a hockey league, but each soon perished. The AFL lives in the NFL's American Conference. Its legacy glistens in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. The Foolish Club was not so foolish after all. Quietly, some AFL loyalists wished that the merger had never happened, that the AFL rivalry with the NFL was still raging, the rivalry created by the rebels with the cause. We were proud of the American Football League. It's something that will live on forever. The players, coaches, owners, we're all in it together. I mean, we're all rowing that boat together. It's kind of like brothers, you know. We would compete against each other, but when someone would say the AFL was second rate, then collectively we'd all take them on. There's a bond that, that, that has, still hasn't been broken. It won't be, as long as there are guys from the old AFL alive. We were a bunch of guys that refused to accept second. To me, it's the epitome of the American dream. We made it despite the odds.